good evening. It's good to see you again this evening. My Bible is going to be open to Genesis chapter 6. I will invite you to open up your Bibles to the same place, Genesis chapter 6. We're going to springboard from there here in just a moment. If you were with us yesterday at all, you, you would have thought that I've made mention of Noah and this lesson 50 times yesterday. Uh, Scott was really the one that knew exactly when the lesson was going to be more than even myself. But it is really, uh, it's an interesting passage, one that a lot of us are probably familiar with. But before we dive into the applications that we're going to pull from it, I do want us to turn to Genesis chapter 6. And we're not going to read all of those two chapters, 6 and 7, that tell the story of Noah and the ark and the flood. But we are going to take a look at some of it to make sure and to make all of us we're on the same page when we start tonight. That all of us have the story in our mind, that all of us are in the same place, and that each and every one of us will be able to spring out of that into the principles and applications that we're going to make from this story this evening. And so in Genesis chapter 6, as the story unfolds, at the outset of this, I want to direct your attention to a few passages. We're going to start in verse 5 as we're setting the scene. So if your Bible is open, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 beginning. It says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. And so what we have at the outset, the setting of this story, is God looking down on man. He sees the wickedness of man, the choices that man has made. And he goes so far to even say that the thoughts and the intents of the heart is only on evil continually. And so God is grieved by that sight. And so he pronounces judgment upon the world. And the judgment is massive worldwide at this time. But as the story unfolds for us, beginning in verse 8 now, we have a new character on the scene, a man by the name of Noah. Let's take a look at 8 now through 14. It says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And so God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark cover it inside and outside with pitch. And we won't read the rest of this chapter, but the rest of this chapter unfolds that God's plans that he gives to Noah as he tells them, I want you now to build this ginormous boat and I want you to build it this way and I want you to build it with these rooms and I want you to build it with these decks and this door. I want you to put all of these things in it and chapter 6 is Noah doing and, and building all that God had told him to do and so the very end of that chapter the very last verse in chapter 6 and verse 22 tells us that Noah did according to all that God commanded him so he did. And so God has told him, I'm going to destroy this wicked earth, but you have found favor. You are walking with me. You are just build this ark for the saving of your family. And so chapter 7 begins. And so the last little piece of context of story is in chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Listen to what's said. It says, The Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household. For I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, 
a male and his female, seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. And so Noah with his sons, his wife, his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two, they went into the ark uh, to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. And so we have now this incredible picture. Years of building this ark because of what God had warned him was about to happen. Now here in chapter 7 has happened. And so Noah, along with his family and all the animals that God told him to collect are now on this boat. And God floods the earth with water. It is an incredible story, an incredible story. And we think about what has happened here, and I want us now to begin to think about Noah and specifically what his motivations were to build the ark. He's motivated to do it because he does it. And I want us to think tonight, we're going to establish a few principles that I think is going to help us as we begin to think about why he does it. What was his motivation? What was the reason he went through all that he went through in order to build this ark? So I want to point out two quick motivations for you. The first is this. Number one, God told him to do it. That is no doubt one of his motivations. We saw already at the end of chapter 6, God told him to do it, and Noah did all that God had told him to do. He completed everything that God had told him to do. A couple more times in chapter 7, that's reiterated. All that God told Noah to do, he did. He listened. We shouldn't be surprised by that. Because we're already told he was a just man. He had a good relationship with God. He walked with God. We should not in any way be surprised by that. And I don't want to gloss over that fact. It is no doubt one of the motivations for why Noah built the ark. Because God said to do it. One interesting thing about this story that I think even builds up this motivation anymore. All of chapter 6 that we went through and read. Chapter 7 that we went through and read, certainly the beginning of chapter 7, Noah in those two chapters up to the point of getting on the ark and God flooding the earth with water, Noah did a bunch of things. Other passages in the New Testament especially tell us that he was preaching in the midst of all that time that he was building the ark. But you notice the text here in Genesis chapter 6 and 7 that we've read all of these incredible things that Noah has done and accomplished and God laid on Noah a bunch of tasks to get done and we know that he did all of those things. Noah hasn't spoken a word up to this point. He hasn't spoken a word. The Bible doesn't tell us that Noah is talking to God or asking God questions about anything. We are just told that of things that Noah was doing because God told him to do. And I think that's telling. I think that gives us something good for us to work on and to be thinking about because it is that very simple idea. God has the authority to direct us, to command us in ways, and we, as his creation, are obligated to follow because he is God. And sometimes we overthink that reality a little bit, and we never should lose sight of that reality. He is God. He is in a position to command us and demand us from things. And so we've got to be willing to listen. And so absolutely one of his motivations with that was that. But a second motivation that we're going to spend the bulk of our time tonight kind of dissecting is the idea that Noah built the ark for the saving of his family. You might say, well, where, where does that idea come from? Well, that idea comes from the pages of the New Testament. We spent a little bit of time in Hebrews chapter 11 
uh, Hebrews chapter 11 uh, yesterday when talking about Abraham and Sarah. Uh, Noah is made mention of in that passage as well. And there's a really interesting phrase that's used that the Hebrew writer gives us an indication of his motivation in every way of why he built this ark. Look at it with me. It says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Do you take notice of what's said? He prepared the ark for the saving of his household. I use the New King James Version. That's what's on the screen here behind me. You may use a different translation. Specifically, the NIV will use a phrase such as this. Very simplistic terms. Noah built an ark to save his family. He built an ark to save his family. Why was he motivated to do that? Why did he do that? Build that ark to save his family. And I'll tell you why. Because he truly believed his family was in danger. He truly believed his family was in danger. Do you see the beginning of this verse? He was divinely warned, and he was moved with godly fear, and he prepared this ark for the saving of his family. God had told them, the end of the earth is coming. In order to save your family, you need to build this ark. He built that ark because he believed what God said was going to happen. If he did not believe, that when God said, I'm going to do something that you have never seen and you cannot comprehend and you cannot even imagine the amount of water that is about to be rained down upon this world. He believed God when he said that. And that's why he built this ark. Doing something that everyone would have taken notice of. Doing something that was different from everything else that anybody else was doing. He did it because he believed his family was in danger. Hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to it. Let's go on a little side quest. Right? Let's do it. A little side quest. We'll come back to that. But it's interesting, the story of Noah and the flood. It's used throughout the pages of the New Testament multiple times. And each and every time it's used, God uses the story to illustrate, to exemplify impending judgment. That's the reason he uses the Noah and the flood story in Scripture. I'm going to give you two examples of that. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. We have Jesus here. He's speaking about impending judgment. And listen to the, what he uses to showcase this reality. In Matthew chapter 24 is where I am. Beginning in verse 36, listen to what Jesus says. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. He did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour the Lord is coming. Go down to verse 44. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You see that, therefore, what Jesus is working up to is impending judgment is coming. You have to make yourself ready because that is a reality. And what does he use to exemplify that? Noah and the flood. Look at another example of that. 2 Peter chapter 3. 
2 Peter chapter 3 in Peter's second epistle, he writes about impending judgment. He writes about the end. And listen to what he says. I'm now 2 Peter chapter 3 beginning in verse 1. He says, Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You see, again, another example of this impending judgment, the point of you got to be ready for this, God chooses to use the story of Noah and the flood. Now take your minds back to Noah. Why did he build that ark? As the Hebrew writer tells us, why did he build the ark? For the saving of his family. Because he believed what God said. I don't think it's really a big coincidence. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 is where we are speaking specifically about Noah. But the one verse above that, verse 6, we talked about the first part of that verse a little bit yesterday. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You've got to believe that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do. That's what faith is all about. And then you have verse 7, by faith Noah did this. And so I want us to really come to the understanding that Noah builds this ark for the saving of his family because he believed they were in danger. He believed they were in danger. Now probably, we're going to go there here in a second, but probably in your mind you're already stretching out to the applications that we're going to make. That's okay for you to do. But be, it becomes very clear as we read a story like this and we begin to think and consider our own family. Because the reality is the same. If we believe, if we believe, as God has said, that this world can come to an end at any time, if we believe that, we too will be motivated to save our families. If we believe that. And Noah certainly did. Let's build on that a little bit more. So what does this look like? What, what does this idea look like, uh, uh, this, uh, him building this ark to save his family? I want to direct your attention to a couple of passages. We're going to start in Ephesians chapter, four, Ephesians chapter 6. So in Ephesians chapter 5, there is a, a passage that is giving us a, a, a taste of what God is looking for within the family and, and different things that husbands, wives, children, and parents need to be thinking about. And listen, there's a lot of things that are said in, in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning of verse 22, down through chapter 6 and verse 4. There are several things that are said, several things that are talked about, but I want us to not overcomplicate this passage. Because I want us to realize what Paul is giving to us in Ephesians chapter 5 to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 is the simplest thing that he can do for every piece of the family. Because here what it, here's what he does. Husbands, here is one thing for you to be thinking about. Wives, here is one thing for you to be thinking about. Children, here is one thing for you to be thinking about. Parents, here is one thing to be thinking about. I don't think it gets any more simple than that. I, I would prefer it be that than here are 7,000 things that you need to be considering. God says, as a husband, here's one thing. And that one thing is you love your wife. You love your wife. 
as yourself. You love your wife as Jesus loved the church. You love your wife. You see this at the very end of chapter 5 and verse 33. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. He sums up. Here's one thing. Love your wife. Wives, here's one thing. Respect your husband. Here's one thing for you to be thinking about. Here's one thing for you to be working on. Respect your husband. And he says at the very end of verse 33, love your own wife as yourself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, here's one thing. Obey your parents as to the Lord. One thing, obey your parents as to the Lord. And so when we get to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, as he makes his way to parents and thinking about their children, he says, you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Don't do that. But here's your one thing. But bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Both the English Standard Version and the New American Standard will use the phrase, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is your one thing. Now listen, we cannot in any capacity overcomplicate that. As parents, when it comes to our families, when it comes to our children, God has laid on us one task. You bring your children up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now let's build on that. Go back to the pages of the Old Testament again, Deuteronomy chapter 6 a passage that you're probably familiar with. We're going to look at it in a little bit different way tonight. But Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want you to listen to the way this text reads, and I want you to do so with the frame of mind of what we've already talked about, what we've already studied about. Now listen to what God is laying down on his people in regards to their families. Listen to this, Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning of verse 1. He says, this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you crossing, uh, you're crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now I want us to think just for a second what it is that God is laying on his people. And I want you to really hone in on verse 7. He says, these statutes, these things that I have given you, you need to teach them to your children. But what are the words that he uses? You need to teach them diligently to your children. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, he tells us in that verse what it looks like. And I'll tell you the application of it we understand because we use this frame of phraseology and this phrasing, we use it to talk about another verse in this context. But sometimes we miss it here in verse 7. Now you have probably heard, you've got good, two good preachers here, Scott and Tyler have probably done this already. When talking about a passage such as this, and talking about when Jesus reiterates our love for God, and we see phrases like, you have to love God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And the point is made, and rightly so, 
that when we do the math on that, if I'm loving God with all that I have, there's nothing else left to love anything else with. I'm giving God everything. That's the point of the passage. That's why you have those extremes that God uses, that Jesus reiterates in the New Testament. He says, when you love God, you have to love him with your everything so that there isn't anything left over. You have to love him with your everything. The same form of speech is used in verse 7. Did you notice that? You've got to teach your children diligently. When do you got to do that? Well, you've got to do that when you're walking. And you've got to do that when you're sitting. And you've got to do that when you're lying down. And you got to do that when you're standing up, and you got to do that at the daytime, and you got to do that in the nighttime. Do you see that same phrasing that's used? Well, what's the point that he's making there? Well, he's making the same point that he just made about our love for God. Our focus on teaching our children diligently God's ways and his business, when is that to take place? Continually. There then is no space or time for any other focus. Now don't jump ahead of me on that. We sang a song that made reference to it just a moment ago, but in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, isn't exactly what Joshua says about his family? When he's talking to the people of Israel and his life is coming kind of to a close and they've kind of settled in the land and he's talking to them about their relationship with God and he's making the point. There's a lot of choices out there. There's a lot of different ways that you can go, a lot of different gods that you can follow and it would be foolish and it would be silly and it would be ridiculous for you to choose any other God but Jehovah. But guess what? You have the power to choose. What does he say? For me, that's the power that I have. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. A powerful statement of faith. He says, listen, when it comes to my family, our focus is going to be God. And if we in any way are interested in saving our household, I'm going to guess we are. It takes this same level of diligence, continually focusing your family on God. Now, here's our reality. A bunch of us, we have lists of things that we would deem important for our families, good things. Good things for our families, good things for our spouses, good things for our kids that we would desire for them to have. Things like good health or good education, to have a good paying job, to be involved in sports or hobbies, to be polite and kind, to be safe. All of those things we would deem as important for our children, for our families, and all of those things are good things. And they're all within themselves good things. But yet when we go to God's word and we see things and realities that all that matters is their knowledge and love for God, a reality then should be taking form that if any of those things that I just listed or any other thing gets in the way of the one thing that God has given to us as parents, that thing has to go it has to go because if we haven't instilled within our families the love of God and his instruction we have failed what God has laid at our feet listen we would make that exact same th statement to every other person in the family when it comes to Ephesians chapter 5 if a husband has not loved his wife as Christ loved the church, he has failed in that role as a husband. If a wife is not submitting herself as to the Lord and respecting her husband, she has failed in regards to being a wife. If children are not obeying their parents as to the Lord, they have failed in that role. 
as leaders in our house, if we have not led our families in the training and admonition of the Lord, we have failed. Maybe they are proficient in lots of other things and a lot of other areas, but God sees that as a failure. Now, here is the key component to all of that. We'll make a couple of applications. We have to be doing that with urgency. You see, Noah believed. He believed the end was coming. He believed that. And so he, with urgency, built that ark and prepared his family for it. So for us... If we believe the end is coming, then we'll do the same. I want you to go back to Hebrews chapter 11 with me. I want you to look at verse 7 one more time. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. Think about this story that's given to us and ask yourself, is it really all that different for us today? Noah lived at a very different time than we live. The culture around him was incredibly different than even our culture today. He lived in a different place and a different time, but I want you to think about verse 7, and I want you to think if it's really all that different for us. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Is that passage really that much different for us today? Have we been warned by God of the end? Have we been warned by God that judgment is coming? Absolutely we have. And if we believe that with urgency, we'll take care of our families. Think about this. What was Noah willing to do to save his family? What was he willing to do? He was willing to take on the monumental task of building this giant boat just the way that God had instructed him to do so. He was willing to round up all of these animals and lead them up onto this boat along with his family. What was Noah willing to do to save his family? So the easy application question that follows that is for each and every one of us. What are we willing to do? What are we willing to give? What are you willing to sacrifice to save yours? This is a powerful, powerful question. Let's, from this same story, make one more application. There's another application out there sitting. Uh, Maybe you're here, and uh, your family has grown, and your family is is gone, and and this application isn't sitting right where you are today. Well, here is an application that's sitting right where all of us are. Think about the reality of this application understanding sitting on us. We've talked about it. The reality of that understanding sitting on us as a father, as a parent, that my family is in danger because the end is coming and I need to move with urgency to make sure they're safe. That application we've made. But there's another area where the same application from the same story can be made for every single one of us another responsibility that God has placed at our feet and an understanding of what we've talked about tonight will make a profound difference on it. And that is our efforts in regards to evangelism. The people that we are around who are lost, our family members, our friends, our neighbors, the people that we know, the people that we love, who we know are in a position that they are not safe. If you sat on the understanding that the end is coming, 
and your friends and your family, they aren't safe. I feel we would move with urgency. That we would move with urgency. So both of those applications, I think, are strong. Here's the difficult part. In order to grab hold of that application, it takes some pretty honest, deep lookingness. It was a little, if you were with us at dinner, you're looking deep. And you've got to be honest with yourself. And you have to think about the way that you've operated with your family. You've got to be thinking about the way that you're operating with those around that, you are, that are lost. And if you are not moving with urgency, you better start thinking about your belief in what God has said. Because if you believe what God has said, you will absolutely operate with urgency. Because just like Noah, he has warned us the end is coming. And we've got to make ourselves ready. We've got to make our families ready. We've got to make the people around us ready. And if we love them, we absolutely will do it. I love this story in Genesis chapter 6. I love the idea that we have in, in Hebrews chapter 11. Noah prepared the ark for the saving of his family. As a father, even all of my children are older than certainly when they were young, and I would think about this a lot. I think about it all the time. But I'll tell you now, I'm thinking about the people around me all the time. And I want to save them as well. And if we begin to think about that in those ways, profound things can begin to happen. What are you willing to do to save your family? Maybe a better question. What are you not willing to do? Maybe that's the question. What are you not willing to do? Again, we can go around the room and all of us would say, I I'd be willing to do anything. There's not anything I wouldn't be willing to do. Let's put that to the test. I'd encourage you to be meditating upon that in the next couple of days. Be thinking about your family. Be thinking about your friends. Be thinking about what you're giving. Be thinking about what you're sacrificing. Be thinking about your mindset because it can make a difference. We're going to sing a song of invitation, and it is exactly what, where we've been tonight, thinking about these kinds of things. There's a reality that God has been so very clear about. His son is coming again. We read that passage of 2 Peter chapter 3. It didn't get any more clearer when you read that passage that when that happens, this earth and everything in it will be burnt up. Life here will be over. And we'll be standing before God in judgment. Opportunities will be gone. Time will be over. But we have an opportunity right now. We have time right now. Let's not foolishly let it go. Let's take advantage of it. Maybe we can help. If we can, 